Chapter 5, Part 3 of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Bobby. A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. Chapter 5, Part 3. Towards dawn he awoke. Oh, what sweet music! His soul was all dewy wet. Over his limbs in sleep pale cool waves of light had passed. He lay still, as if his soul lay amid cool waters, conscious of faint sweet music. His mind was waking slowly to a tremulous morning knowledge, a morning inspiration. A spirit filled him, pure as the purest water, sweet as dew, moving as music. But how faintly it was inbreathed, how passionlessly, as if the seraphim themselves were breathing upon him. His soul was waking slowly, fearing to wake wholly. It was that windless hour of dawn when madness wakes and strange plants open to the light and the moth flies forth silently. An enchantment of the heart. The night had been enchanted, in a dream or vision he had known the ecstasy of seraphic life. Was it an instant of enchantment only, or long hours and days and years and ages? The instant of inspiration seemed now to be reflected from all sides at once, from a multitude of cloudy circumstance of what had happened or of what might have happened. The instant flashed forth like a point of light, and now from cloud on cloud of vague circumstance confused form was veiling softly its afterglow. Oh! In the virgin womb of the imagination the word was made flesh. Gabriel the seraph had come to the virgin's chamber. An afterglow deepened within his spirit, whence the white flame had passed, deepening to a rose and ardent light. That rose and ardent light was her strange, willful heart, strange that no man had known or would know, willful from before the beginning of the world. And lured by that ardent rose-like glow, the choirs of the seraphim were falling from heaven. Are you not weary of ardent ways, lure of the fallen seraphim, tell no more of enchanted days? The verses passed from his mind to his lips, and, murmuring them over, he felt the rhythmic movement of a villanelle pass through them. The rose-like glow sent forth its rays of rhyme, ways, days, blaze, praise, rays. Its rays burned up the world, consumed the hearts of men and angels, the rays from the rose that was her willful heart. Your eyes have set man's heart ablaze, and you have had your will of him. Are you not weary of ardent ways? And then the rhythm died away, ceased, began again to move and beat, and then smoke, incense ascending from the altar of the world. Above the flame the smoke of praise goes up from ocean rim to rim, tell no more of enchanted days. Smoke went up from the whole earth, from the vapory oceans, smoke of her praise. The earth was like a swinging, smoking, swaying censer, a ball of incense, an ellipsoidal ball. The rhythm died out at once. The cry of his heart was broken. His lips began to murmur the first verses over and over, then went on stumbling through half-verses, stammering and baffled, then stopped. The heart's cry was broken. The veiled windless hour had passed, and behind the panes of the naked window the morning light was gathering. A bell beat faintly very far away. A bird twittered, two birds, three. The bell and the bird ceased, and the dull white light spread itself east and west, covering the world, covering the rose-light in his heart. Fearing to lose all, he raised himself suddenly on his elbow to look for paper and pencil. There was neither on the table, only the soup-plate he had eaten the rice from for supper, and the candlestick with its tendrils of tallow and its paper socket, singed by the last flame. 
He stretched his arm wearily towards the foot of the bed, groping with his hand in the pockets of the coat that hung there. His fingers found a pencil and then a cigarette packet. He lay back and, tearing open the packet, placed the last cigarette on the window ledge and began to write out the stanzas of the villanelle in small, neat letters on the rough cardboard surface. Having written them out, he lay back on the lumpy pillow, murmuring them again. The lumps of knotted flock under his head reminded him of the lumps of knotted horsehair in the sofa of her parlour on which he used to sit, smiling or serious, asking himself why he had come, displeased with her and with himself, confounded by the print of the sacred heart above the untenanted sideboard. He saw her approach him in a lull of the talk and beg him to sing one of his curious songs. Then he saw himself sitting at the old piano, striking chords softly from its speckled keys and singing, amid the talk which had risen again in the room, to her who leaned beside the mantelpiece a dainty song of the Elizabethans, a sad and sweet loth to depart, the victory chant of Agincourt, the happy air of green sleeves. While he sang and she listened, or feigned to listen, his heart was at rest, but when the quaint old songs had ended and he heard again the voices in the room, he remembered his own sarcasm, the house where young men are called by their Christian names a little too soon. At certain instants her eyes seemed about to trust him, but he had waited in vain. She passed now, dancing lightly across his memory, as she had been that night at the carnival ball, her white dress a little lifted, a white spray nodding in her hair. She danced lightly in the round. She was dancing towards him, and, as she came, her eyes were a little averted and a faint glow was on her cheek. At the pause in the chain of hands, her hand had lain in his an instant, a soft merchandise. You are a great stranger now. Yes, I was born to be a monk. I am afraid you are a heretic. Are you much afraid? For answer she had danced away from him along the chain of hands, dancing lightly and discreetly, giving herself to none. The white spray nodded to her dancing, and when she was in shadow the glow was deeper on her cheek. A monk! His own image started forth, a profaner of the cloister, a heretic Franciscan, willing and willing not to serve, spinning like Gerardino da Borgo Sandonino, a lithe web of sophistry and whispering in her ear. No, it was not his image. It was like the image of the young priest in whose company he had seen her last, looking at him out of dove's eyes, toying with the pages of her Irish phrase-book. Yes, yes, the ladies are coming round to us. I can see it every day. The ladies are with us, the best helpers the language has. And the church, Father Moran? The church, too, coming round, too. The work is going ahead there, too. Don't fret about the church. Bah! He had done well to leave the room in disdain. He had done well not to salute her on the steps of the library. He had done well to leave her to flirt with her priest, to toy with a church which was the scullery maid of Christendom. Rude, brutal anger routed the last lingering instant of ecstasy from his soul. It broke up violently her fair image and flung the fragments on all sides. On all sides distorted reflections of her image started from his memory, the flower-girl in the ragged dress with damp, coarse hair on a hoyden's face, who had called herself his own girl and begged his hansel, the kitchen-girl in the next house who sang over the clatter of her plates with the drawl of a country singer the first bars of By Killarney's Lakes and Fells, a girl who had laughed gaily to see him stumble when the iron grating in the footpath near Cork Hill had caught the broken sole of his shoe, a girl he had glanced at, attracted by her small ripe mouth as she passed out of Jacob's biscuit factory, who had cried to him over her shoulder, Do you like what you've seen of me, straight hair and curly eyebrows? And yet he felt that, however he might revile and mock her image, his anger was also a form of homage. He had left the classroom in disdain that was not wholly sincere, feeling that perhaps the secret of her race lay behind those dark eyes upon which her long lashes flung a quick shadow. He had told himself bitterly as he walked through the streets that she was a figure of the womanhood of her country, 
a bat-like soul waking to the consciousness of itself in darkness and secrecy and loneliness, tarrying a while, loveless and sinless, with her mild lover, and leaving him to whisper of innocent transgressions in the latticed ear of a priest. His anger against her found vent in coarse railing at her paramour, whose name and voice and features offended his baffled pride. A priested peasant, with a brother a policeman in Dublin, and a brother a potboy in Moycullen. To him she would unveil her soul's shy nakedness, to one who was but schooled in the discharging of a formal rite, rather than to him, a priest of eternal imagination, transmuting the daily bread of experience into the radiant body of ever-living life. The radiant image of the Eucharist united again in an instant his bitter and despairing thoughts, their cries arising unbroken in a hymn of thanksgiving. Our broken cries and mournful lays rise in one Eucharistic hymn, Are you not weary of ardent ways? While sacrificing hands upraise the chalice flowing to the brim, tell no more of enchanted days. He spoke the verses aloud from the first lines till the music and rhythm suffused his mind, turning it to quiet indulgence, then copied them painfully to feel them the better by seeing them, then lay back on his bolster. The full morning light had come. No sound was to be heard but he knew that all around him life was about to awaken in common noises, hoarse voices, sleepy prayers. Shrinking from that life, he turned towards the wall, making a cowl of the blanket and staring at the great overblown scarlet flowers of the tattered wallpaper. He tried to warm his perishing joy in their scarlet glow, imagining a roseway from where he lay upwards to heaven all strewn with scarlet flowers. Weary! Weary! He, too, was weary of ardent ways. A gradual warmth, a languorous weariness, passed over him, descending along his spine from his closely cowled head. He felt it descend and, seeing himself as he lay, smiled. Soon he would sleep. He had written verses for her again after ten years. Ten years before she had worn her shawl cowl-wise about her head, sending sprays of her warm breath into the night air, tapping her foot upon the glassy road. It was the last tram. The lank brown horses knew it and shook their bells to the clear night in admonition. The conductor talked with the driver, both nodding often in the green light of the lamp. They stood on the steps of the tram, he on the upper, she on the lower. She came up to his step many times between their phrases, and went down again, and once or twice remained beside him, forgetting to go down, and then went down. Let be! Let be! Ten years from that wisdom of children to his folly. If he sent her the verses, they would be read out at breakfast amid the tapping of eggshells. Folly indeed! The brothers would laugh and try to wrest the page from each other with their strong, hard fingers. The suave priest, her uncle, seated in his armchair, would hold the page at arm's length, read it smiling, and approve of the literary form. No, no, that was folly. Even if he sent her the verses, she would not show them to others. No, no, she could not. He began to feel that he had wronged her. A sense of her innocence moved him almost to pity her, an innocence he had never understood till he had come to the knowledge of it through sin an innocence which she, too, had not understood while she was innocent or before the strange humiliation of her nature had first come upon her. Then first her soul had begun to live as his soul had when he had first sinned, and a tender compassion filled his heart as he remembered her frail pallor and her eyes, humbled and saddened by the dark shame of womanhood. While his soul had passed from ecstasy to languor, where had she been? Might it be, in the mysterious ways of spiritual life, that her soul at those same moments had been conscious of his homage? It might be. A glow of desire kindled again his soul, and fired and fulfilled all his body. Conscious of his desire, she was waking from odorous sleep, the temptress of his villanelle. Her eyes, dark and with a look of languor, were opening to his eyes. Her nakedness yielded to him, radiant, warm, odorous and lavish-limbed, enfolded him like a shining cloud, enfolded him like water with a liquid life. 
and like a cloud of vapour or like waters circumfluent in space, the liquid letters of speech, symbols of the element of mystery, flowed forth over his brain. Are you not weary of ardent ways, lure of the fallen seraphim? Tell no more of enchanted days. Your eyes have set man's heart ablaze, and you have had your will of him. Are you not weary of ardent ways? Above the flame the smoke of praise goes up from ocean rim to rim, till no more of enchanted days. Our broken cries and mournful lays rise in one Eucharistic hymn. Are you not weary of ardent ways? While sacrificing hands upraise the chalice flowing to the brim, tell no more of enchanted days. And still you hold our longing gaze with languorous look and lavish limb, are you not weary of ardent ways? Tell no more of enchanted days. What birds were they? He stood on the steps of the library to look at them, leaning wearily on his ash-plant. They flew round and round the jutting shoulder of a house in Molesworth Street. The air of the late March evening made clear their flight, their dark, darting, quivering bodies flying clearly against the sky as against a limp-hung cloth of smoky, tenuous blue. He watched their flight, bird after bird, a dark flash, a swerve, a flash again, a dart aside, a curve, a flutter of wings. He tried to count them before all their darting, quivering bodies passed, six, ten, eleven, and wondered were they odd or even in number, twelve, thirteen, for two came wheeling down from the upper sky. They were flying high and low, but ever round and round in straight and curving lines, and ever flying from left to right, circling about a temple of air. He listened to the cries, like the squeak of mice behind the wainscot, a shrill twofold note. But the notes were long and shrill and whirring, unlike the cry of vermin, falling a third or a fourth, and trilled as the flying beaks clove the air. Their cry was shrill and clear and fine and falling like threads of silken light unwound from whirring spools. The inhuman clamor soothed his ears in which his mother's sobs and reproaches murmured insistently, and the dark, frail, quivering bodies wheeling and fluttering and swerving round an airy temple of the tenuous sky soothed his eyes which still saw the image of his mother's face. Why was he gazing upwards from the steps of the porch? hearing their shrill twofold cry, watching their flight? For an augury of good or evil? A phrase of Cornelius Agrippa flew through his mind, and then there flew hither and thither shapeless thoughts from Swedenborg on the correspondence of birds to things of the intellect, and of how the creatures of the air have their knowledge and know their times and seasons, because they, unlike man, are in the order of their life and have not perverted that order by reason." and for ages men had gazed upward as he was gazing at birds in flight. The colonnade above him made him think vaguely of an ancient temple and the ash-plant on which he leaned wearily of the curved stick of an auger. A sense of fear of the unknown moved in the heart of his weariness, a fear of symbols and portents, of the hawk-like man whose name he bore, soaring out of his captivity on osier-woven wings, of Thoth, the god of writers, writing with a reed upon a tablet and bearing on his narrow ibis head the cusped moon. He smiled as he thought of the god's image, for it made him think of a bottle-nosed judge in a wig, putting commas into a document which he held at arm's length, and he knew that he would not have remembered the god's name, but that it was like an Irish oath. It was folly. But was it for this folly that he was about to leave for ever the house of prayer and prudence into which he had been born, and the order of life out of which he had come? They came back with shrill cries over the jutting shoulder of the house, flying darkly against the fading air. What birds were they? He thought that they must be swallows who had come back from the south. Then he was to go away, for they were birds ever going and coming building ever an unlasting home under the eaves of men's houses, and ever leaving the homes they had built to wander. Bend down your faces, Una and Aleel. I gaze upon them as the swallow gazes upon the nest under the eave before he wander the loud waters. A soft liquid joy like the noise of many waters flowed over his memory, and he felt in his heart the soft peace of silent spaces of fading tenuous sky above the waters, of oceanic silence, 
of swallows flying through the sea-dusk over the flowing waters. A soft liquid joy flowed through the words where the soft long vowels hurtled noiselessly and fell away, lapping and flowing back and ever shaking the white bells of their waves in mute chime and mute peal and soft low swooning cry. And he felt that the augury he had sought in the wheeling darting birds and in the pale space of sky above him had come forth from his heart like a bird from a turret, quietly and swiftly. Symbol of departure or of loneliness? The verses crooned in the ear of his memory composed slowly before his remembering eyes the scene of the hall on the night of the opening of the National Theatre. He was alone at the side of the balcony, looking out of jaded eyes at the culture of Dublin in the stalls, and at the tawdry scene-cloths and human dolls framed by the garish lamps of the stage. A burly policeman sweated behind him and seemed at every moment about to act. The catcalls and hisses and mocking cries ran in rude gusts round the hall from his scattered fellow students. A libel on Ireland! Made in Germany! Blasphemy! We never sold our faith! No Irish woman ever did it! We want no amateur atheists! We want no budding Buddhists! A sudden swift hiss fell from the windows above him, and he knew that the electric lamps had been switched on in the reader's room. He turned into the pillared hall, now calmly lit, went up the staircase, and passed in through the clicking turnstile. Cranley was sitting over near the dictionaries. A thick book, opened at the frontispiece, lay before him on the wooden rest. He leaned back in his chair, inclining his ear like that of a confessor to the face of the medical student who was reading to him a problem from the chess page of a journal. Stephen sat down at his right and the priest at the other side of the table closed his copy of the tablet with an angry snap and stood up. Cranley gazed after him, blandly and vaguely. The medical student went on in a softer voice. Pawn to King's Forth. "'We had better go, Dixon,' said Stephen in mourning. "'He has gone to complain.' Dixon folded the journal and rose with dignity, saying, "'Our men retired in good order.' "'With guns and cattle,' added Stephen, pointing to the title-page of Cranley's book, on which was printed Diseases of the Ox. As they passed through a lane of the tables, Stephen said, Cranley, I want to speak to you. Cranley did not answer or turn. He laid his book on the counter and passed out, his well-shod feet sounding flatly on the floor. On the staircase he paused, and gazing absently at Dixon, repeated, Pawn to King's bloody fourth. Put it that way if you like, Dixon said. He had a quiet, toneless voice and urbane manners, and on a finger of his plump, clean hand he displayed at moments a signet ring. As they crossed the hall a man of dwarfish stature came towards them. Under the dome of his tiny hat his unshaven face began to smile with pleasure, and he was heard to murmur. The eyes were melancholy as those of a monkey. "'Good evening, Captain,' said Cranley, halting. "'Good evening, gentlemen,' said the stubble-grown monkeyish face. "'Warm weather for March,' said Cranley. "'They have the windows open upstairs.' Dixon smiled and turned his ring. The blackish, monkey-puckered face pursed its human mouth with gentle pleasure, and its voice purred, "'Delightful weather for March. Simply delightful.' "'There are two nice young ladies upstairs, Captain, tired of waiting,' Dixon said. Cranley smiled and said kindly, "'The Captain has only one love, Sir Walter Scott. Isn't that so, Captain?' "'What are you reading now, Captain?' Dixon asked. "'The Bride of Lammermoor?' "'I love old Scott,' the flexible lips said. "'I think he writes something lovely. "'There is no writer can touch Sir Walter Scott.' He moved a thin, shrunken brown hand gently in the air in time to his praise, and his thin, quick eyelids beat often over his sad eyes. Sadder to Stephen's ear was his speech, a genteel accent, low and moist, marred by errors and listening to it he wondered was the story true, and was the thin blood that flowed in his shrunken frame noble, and come of an incestuous love. The park trees were heavy with rain, and rain fell still and ever in the lake, lying grey like a shield. A game of swans flew there, and the water and the shore beneath were fouled with their green-white slime. They embraced softly, impelled by the grey, rainy light, the wet, silent trees, the shield-like witnessing lake, the swans. They embraced without joy or passion, 
his arm about his sister's neck. A grey woolen cloak was wrapped athwart her from her shoulder to her waist, and her fair head was bent in willing shame. He had loose red-brown hair and tender, shapely, strong, freckled hands. Face. There was no face seen. The brother's face was bent upon her fair, rain-fragrant hair. The hand, freckled and strong and shapely and caressing, was Davin's hand. He frowned angrily upon his thought and on the shriveled mannequin who had called it forth. His father's jibes at the bantry gang leaped out of his memory. He held them at a distance and brooded uneasily on his own thought again. Why were they not Cranley's hands? Had Davin's simplicity and innocence stung him more secretly? He walked on across the hall with Dixon, leaving Cranley to take leave elaborately of the dwarf. Under the colonnade, Temple was standing in the midst of a little group of students. One of them cried, "'Dixon, come over till you hear. Temple is in grand form.' Temple turned on him his dark, gypsy eyes. "'You're a hypocrite, O'Keefe,' he said, "'and Dixon's a smiler. By hell, I think that's a good literary expression.' He laughed slyly, looking in Stephen's face, repeating, "'By hell, I'm delighted with that name. A smiler!' A stout student who stood below them on the steps said, Come back to the mistress, Temple. We want to hear about that. He had faith, Temple said, and he was a married man, too. And all the priests used to be dining there. By hell, I think they all had a touch. We shall call it riding a hack to spare the hunter, said Dixon. Tell us, Temple, O'Keefe said, how many quarts of porter have you in you? All your intellectual soul is in that phrase, O'Keefe, said Temple with open scorn. He moved with a shambling gait round the group and spoke to Stephen. "'Did you know that the Forsters are the kings of Belgium?' he asked. Cranley came out through the door of the entrance hall, his hat thrust back on the nape of his neck, and picking his teeth with care. "'And here's the wiseacre,' said Temple. "'Do you know that about the Forsters?' He paused for an answer. Cranley dislodged a fig-seed from his teeth on the point of his rude toothpick and gazed at it intently. The Forster family, Temple said, is descended from Baldwin I, King of Flanders. He was called the Forester. Forester and Forster are the same name. A descendant of Baldwin I, Captain Francis Forster, settled in Ireland and married the daughter of the last chieftain of Clan Brasil. Then there are the Blake Forsters. That's a different branch. From Baldhead, King of Flanders, Cranley repeated, rooting again deliberately at his gleaming uncovered teeth. Where did you pick up all that history? O'Keefe asked. I know all the history of your family, too, Temple said, turning to Stephen. Do you know what Geraldus Cambrensis says about your family? Is he descended from Baldwin, too? asked a tall, consumptive student with dark eyes. Baldhead, Cranley repeated, sucking at a crevice in his teeth. Per nobilis et per retusta familia, Temple said to Stephen. The stout student who stood below them on the steps farted briefly. Dixon turned towards him, saying in a soft voice, Did an angel speak? Cranley turned also and said vehemently, but without anger, Goggins, you're the flamingest dirty devil I ever met, do you know? I had it on my mind to say that, Goggins answered firmly. It did no one any harm, did it? We hope, Dixon said suavely, that it was not of the kind known to science as Paolo post futurum. Didn't I tell you he was a smiler? said Temple, turning right and left. Didn't I give him that name? You did. We're not deaf, said the tall consumptive. Cranley still frowned at the stout student below him. Then, with a snort of disgust, he shoved him violently down the steps. Go away from here, he said rudely. Go away, you stinkpot. And you are a stinkpot. Goggins skipped down onto the gravel and at once returned to his place with good humor. Temple turned back to Stephen and asked, Do you believe in the law of heredity? Are you drunk, or what are you? Or what are you trying to say? asked Cranley, facing round on him with an expression of wonder. The most profound sentence ever written, Temple said with enthusiasm, is the sentence at the end of the zoology. Reproduction is the beginning of death. He touched Stephen timidly at the elbow and said eagerly, Do you feel how profound that is because you are a poet? Cranley pointed his long forefinger. Look at him, he said with scorn to the others. Look at Ireland's hope. They laughed at his words and gesture. Temple turned on him bravely, saying, Cranley, you're always sneering at me. I can see that, but I am as good as you any day. 
Do you know what I think about you now as compared with myself? My dear man, said Cranley urbanely, you are incapable, you know, absolutely incapable of thinking. But do you know, Temple went on, what I think of you and of myself compared together? Out with it, Temple, the stout student cried from the steps. Get it out in bits. Temple turned right and left, making sudden feeble gestures as he spoke. I'm a ballox, he said, shaking his head in despair. I am, and I know I am, and I admit it that I am. Dixon patted him lightly on the shoulder and said mildly, And it does you every credit, Temple. But he, Temple said, pointing to Cranley, he is a ballox too, like me, only he doesn't know it, and that's the only difference I see. A burst of laughter covered his words but he turned again to Stephen and said with a sudden eagerness, "'That word is a most interesting word. That's the only English dual number. Did you know?' "'Is it?' said Stephen vaguely. He was watching Cranley's firm-featured suffering face, lit up now by a smile of false patience. The gross name had passed over it like foul water poured over an old stone image, patient of injuries, and, as he watched him, he saw him raise his hat in salute and uncover the black hair that stood up stiffly from his forehead like an iron crown. She passed out from the porch of the library and bowed across Stephen in reply to Cranley's greeting. He also? Was there not a slight flush on Cranley's cheek? Or had it come forth at Temple's words? The light had waned. He could not see. Did that explain his friend's listless silence, his harsh comments, the sudden intrusions of rude speech with which he had shattered so often Stephen's ardent, wayward confessions? Stephen had forgiven freely, for he had found this rudeness also in himself towards himself, and he remembered an evening when he had dismounted from a borrowed creaking bicycle to pray to God in a wood near Malahide. He had lifted up his arms and spoken in ecstasy to the sombre nave of the trees, knowing that he stood on holy ground and in a holy hour. And when two constabulary men had come into sight round a bend in the gloomy road, he had broken off his prayer to whistle loudly an air from the last pantomime. He began to beat the frayed end of his ash-plant against the base of a pillar. Had Cranley not heard him? Yet he could wait. The talk about him ceased for a moment, and a soft hiss fell again from a window above but no other sound was in the air, and the swallows whose flight he had followed with idle eyes were sleeping. She had passed through the dusk, and therefore the air was silent save for one soft hiss that fell, and therefore the tongues about him had ceased their babble. Darkness was falling. Darkness falls from the air. A trembling joy, lambent as a faint light, played like a fairy host around him. But why? Her passage through the darkening air, or the verse with its black vowels and its opening sound, rich and lute-like? He walked away slowly towards the deeper shadows at the end of the colonnade, beating the stones softly with his stick to hide his reverie from the students whom he had left, and allowed his mind to summon back to itself the age of Dowland and Bird and Nash. Eyes, opening from the darkness of desire, eyes that dimmed the breaking east, what was their languid grace but the softness of chambering? And what was their shimmer but the shimmer of the scum that mantled the cesspool of the court of a slobbering Stuart? And he tasted in the language of memory ambered wines, dying fallings of sweet airs, the proud pavan, and saw with the eyes of memory kind gentlewomen in Covent Garden wooing from their balconies with sucking mouths and the pox-fouled wenches of the taverns and young wives that, gaily yielding to their ravishers, clipped and clipped again. The images he had summoned gave him no pleasure. They were secret and inflaming, but her image was not entangled by them. That was not the way to think of her. It was not even the way in which he thought of her. Could his mind then not trust itself? Old phrases, sweet only with a disinterred sweetness like the fig-seeds Cranley rooted out of his gleaming teeth. It was not thought nor vision, though he knew vaguely that her figure was passing homeward through the city. Vaguely first, and then more sharply, he smelt her body. A conscious unrest seethed in his blood. Yes, it was her body he smelt, a wild and languid smell, 
the tepid limbs over which his music had flowed desirously, and the secret soft linen upon which her flesh distilled odour and a dew. A louse crawled over the nape of his neck, and, putting his thumb and forefinger deftly beneath his loose collar, he caught it. He rolled its body, tender yet brittle as a grain of rice, between thumb and finger for an instant before he let it fall from him, and wondered would it live or die. There came to his mind a curious phrase from Cornelius a Lapide, which said that the lice born of human sweat were not created by God with the other animals on the sixth day. But the tickling of the skin of his neck made his mind raw and red. The life of his body, ill-clad, ill-fed, louse-eaten, made him close his eyelids in a sudden spasm of despair. And in the darkness he saw the brittle bright bodies of lice falling from the air and turning often as they fell. Yes, and it was not darkness that fell from the air. It was brightness. Brightness falls from the air. He had not even remembered rightly Nash's line. All the images it had awakened were false. His mind bred vermin. His thoughts were lice born of the sweat of sloth. He came back quickly along the colonnade towards the group of students. Well, then, let her go and be damned to her. She could love some clean athlete who washed himself every morning to the waist and had black hair on his chest. Let her. End of chapter 5, part 3